uh, try to watch it, I guess, from the privacy of their rooms. But uh, <laughs> it's also, I think, a difficult time for our students because of the final year projects. But I'm delighted to announce uh, today's uh, lecture in our series of the Performance Research Seminar. It takes place every two weeks, and we have distinguished guests who address uh, issues from their research fields. And today we have uh, Sita Popat and uh, Scott um, Palmer with us from University of Leeds. Sita is uh, working in the field of dance and choreography and interactive technology and telematics. She's uh, worked extensively in, in experimentation with dance and the internet. And uh, Scott, I think you are uh, uh, teaching in scenography. That's correct. And uh, specializes in uh, lighting design technologies and also interactive technologies. And they have worked together in numerous projects. And I think today you will be introducing some uh, thoughts from your dancing sprites and digitized spaces concept. So camera will be on them and on uh, the visual material. And after a certain period of uh, presentation, there will be question and answer. So please, let's welcome Sita Popat and Scott Palmer. Yeah? Thank you very much. And um, we're delighted to be here at uh, Brunel. Thank you for inviting us. Today, we're going to tell you um, uh, a story about a particular collaboration that we've had over the last four years uh, with a commercial digital arts company. Uh, and they are KMA Creative Technology Limited, who are based in York. And the two practitioners who we've been working very closely with are Tom Wexler and Kit Monkman from that particular company. Tom and Kit started out, um, before they, they were working with us, they were working primarily in web design and also uh, doing large scale popular music uh, tour backgrounds and uh, projection images for people like uh, Kylie Minogue and Craig David. Craig David. So they came to us uh, in 2004 because they had been asked by Phoenix Dance Theatre if they would do some visuals for the new piece Ingerland that was being uh, choreographed by, uh, by Darshan Singh Buller. And they had never worked with dancers, so they wanted to find out a little bit about uh, dance creative processes and practices uh, to be able to communicate effectively and efficiently with Phoenix Dance Theatre in their practice. We actually had a student on a work placement, an industry study placement with them at the time, who suggested that perhaps Sita and I were the kind of people that they ought to be uh, talking to in relation to preparing this piece. Um, so we embarked on, we created a couple of days uh, time in a studio space, not unlike the one we're in currently, to allow um, a playful engagement with the technologies which they brought to, um, to the space. And on this little short snippet of video, you'll see um, the very first uh, moments of the technology being um, used. So what you're seeing here is digital projections that are being uh, projected in onto a gauze or a, a scrim. Um, and a, one of our dancers just uh, improvising with the resulting light forms. You'll, you'll see in the background, this is just there's no preparation here. You see there's technicians walking around still setting the lighting up for our exploration. It's really quite important for us because this is our very first um, footsteps really into uh, exploring the potential of this technology. What you're seeing here is a uh, front projection onto a screen, a, a, a gauze that's uh, in front of the dancer. The dancer is looking at the, uh, the image and interacting with it. Uh, facing the gauze and the dancer is uh, Tom Wexler from KMA and he's controlling that sprite uh, using a mouse. So he and the dancer are improvising together uh, as they're working there. So KMA had a very particular um, reason for wanting to come to us. We, uh, we cr created the time and the space in which we could play within a sort of performance laboratory environment um, to explore whether there might be any future potential for us in terms of our research. And then KMA went and uh, worked with Phoenix, and some of you may have seen the piece Ingerland, and we've got just a snippet here. What you're seeing there actually is multiple projections on two planes of gauzes, a front projection and a back projection. Um, but uh, 
that's not interactive in the way in which we developed our research. What you're seeing there is um, the dancers having been choreographed very tightly to a pre-recorded sequence of projected imagery, and that's quite important. So out of that workshop came a research project which was funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council, and we were asking two key questions. In the work that we've been doing in that um, preliminary workshop, we had identified the role of the operator as being performative, and we, we had called that person the performer operator because they were uh, operating a sprite that represented them in that space. They were taking uh, a role with the dancer as a co-performer. So we had a question about the relationship between the performer dancer, the projected image, and the offstage performer operator. And then sitting over that was a question about the methodologies for engagement and collaboration between uh, performance academics and digital technologists. We were responding to what we were identifying for the purposes of this project as three modes of projection in performance. And these are quite catch-all in a way, but it was a useful way for us to think about it. There's the prepared scenographic element, which you just saw in Ingerland there, where the, uh, the, the, the DVD or whatever it is is started and the dancers keep up with that or the actors work with that. But primarily the, 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 uh, the image keeps going and the performers have to stay with it. If the uh, performers stop or if the image stops, sorry, if the image stops and the performers are stuck, they have to, they have to wait for the image. And it breaks that illusion of yeah. the interactivity. Then there's the interactive stage environment in the li along the lines of Troy Karachi's work and Palindrome's work, where the performer in the stage space is controlling the environment around them by triggering um, uh, the, uh, the different things that happen in the stage environment. And, uh, and this can be very effective, but it also gives the dancer responsibility for the stage picture which they cannot see. So they are working within that space, but without a sense of what that space looks like, and yet they are tr triggering visual elements within that. Then we also have telematic performance, uh, where there is a, a dialogue that is enabled through the technology. And this was what, where we placed our work, where we saw our work lying. So the technology and the performer were working together. Our research methodology hung very heavily on play, uh, short intensive bursts of workshop um, activity, and then periods of reflection time. We worked with a, a, a cycle of writing as a reflective tool and practice. And we developed our ideas by questioning what happened within the practical environment through our writing and then bringing that back into the practice. So there was a braiding. And reviewing our, our kind of practical outcomes through the use of video work, which you'll see through some of the examples we're showing you, was problematic in itself because we're using fairly low light levels. And obviously the video camera doesn't respond as well as the, the human eye. So we've had some issues in terms of how we document this particular practice, particularly when we're using very low light levels. So the key issue behind this project was the performer operator, in which the offstage operator sees, controls, and performs the projected image within the stage picture. And here's some examples of some of the uh, work, some of the material that we generated in our workshops. You're seeing a range of different sprites, as we called them. We, we originally called them that because we're using director software and it's, they're called sprites within that, but we actually found that it was a useful term in the way that it, it had uh, a sense of, of its own presence and identity, uh, even though it was being controlled by an operator. So we stayed with that term. When the company first came to us, they were um, Tom Wexler, who had programmed these, uh, a range of sprites, uh, was operating them with a mouse. I mean, he'd, he'd designed these sprites and was operating them very uh, intuitively, really, with a mouse, which wasn't actually the most useful interface um, for anybody else to operate with. We, we, cho we, we suggested we replace the mouse with a, a graphic tablet and pen, a, a Wacom uh, tablet, which um, was a really important uh, development because it freed up a kind of much more expressive way of controlling the sprite. Um, so, uh, and as Cetus just mentioned, we, we were using um, a director originally. Uh, Tom was able to change the various parameters of the sprites by um, uh, online um, 
uh, programming. Um, so we could we could say, right, that's very nice, Tom, but can we have it in orange or in red? Or could you make it voice reactive? Or could you just make the delay on, on, on that particular movement to be much longer? Uh, and he'd say, yes, hang on a minute. And two or three minutes later, he, he would have adjusted the various parameters. So it gave us, at that time, quite a quick way of um, working with the technology that's, that's perhaps not necessarily... Um, uh, familiar to those of, of us who work in the theatre, where may, maybe changes in technological changes perhaps take a little bit longer to um, achieve. The graphics tablet freed up gestural control because it gave you the option of quite sweeping large movements, particularly as we, we expanded the size of the graphics tablet, but also quite fine detail and use of, of fine motor skills. You can see Lisette there at the front is, is using one of the small graphics tablets that we started out with. We also took the screens away completely, the computer screens away completely, so that the operator was working straight onto the gauze with the dancer and could see the dancer behind the gauze. So there was very strong sense of uh, a dialogue through the, uh, through the interaction. Later on in the process, we asked, um, we actually required a more, um, uh, a more intuitive response, and we actually pushed KMA to come up with some solutions to allow us for more, more immediate uh, transformation of these sprites live within the stage space. So rather than, rather than having a delay for the short programming time, asking for much more immediacy in terms of being able to change the color shifts uh, in real time for example, or to change some of the, the qualities of the sprites actually in real time. So um, one, of the, one of those things was pushing them to, towards uh, Max MSP. Uh, another thing was we, we, uh, we applied this in a performance context and asked to be able to fade out sprites to, to black, for example. Uh, and uh, as a basis of that, Tom um, worked on a MIDI interface as well, which we used alongside the graphics tablet and pen. All the sprites have their own behaviours. They have within them particular qualities about the way that they move. Uh, some have uh, more uh, pre-programmed behaviour. Uh, some are more directly responsive to the movement of the, the pen. And this will uh, come out in a moment as being uh, important. We're just going to show you two examples of sprites. This sprite we call Snake Sprite. It's a very, very simple. Uh about eight or nine straight, um, straight lines, just interconnected. You can see it there, crawling along my arm. Uh, Tom is operating it, and he, he has extremely uh, good fine motor skills. So he's able to make the, the snake uh, very stay very close to me and also have quite expressive movement. I'm standing behind a black gauze, and this, the, my arm is actually touching the gauze. So there's a, a sort of tactile sensation. Um, in, in the contact with the gauze. What's also happening is that because we're using a black gauze, there's light spill through the gauze, and the light is spilling onto my arm. I just dropped it there, as you saw. But, um, of course, I didn't really drop it. Tom is playing with it. But you get sensation of that, and you get the sensation of weight from that. And when the light comes through onto your skin, that also, although you can see light on your skin, it makes you feel warmth, even though there isn't any warmth. It, there's a sort of a hint of, a, of, of some kind of reaction to that in your skin. So there's quite a strong sense of a physical contact with this projected light image. And for us, it's very important that the dancers are behind the gauze so that they can see it, so that the interaction is, is real. And you can see here, there's a sense of there uh, of, of uh, removing or adding a, a sort of simulated gravity to the sprites. It suddenly falls out of the s out of the space, and that's by adjusting one of the parameters live. This, this is the star sprite, um, and Sita's operating this. And you, I think you can tell that there's a dancer operating the sprite in tandem with a dancer on the stage. You're actually getting a dual image here, because it's actually it's being projected onto a front gauze and then also onto a black background behind. The dancer here is one of our third year undergraduates, and she, uh, she, I've worked with her for the three years that she was an undergraduate. I know her quite well. Um, so we're improvising together. We're actually warming up in this particular moment, but we, we captured it, and we, uh, we found that it showed very clearly the connection between dancer and operator. There's nothing, um, nothing here that is uh, pre-choreographed. It's, it's very much uh, an improvisation, as if I was a dancer in the space. And this star sprite, again, which is, you can also see in our logo here, we, we can actually change how many uh, limbs it has, um, its colour, uh, and, and the way in which it moves, how springy it is. Um, 
but it has a lot of inherent behavior in that it doesn't always behave the same way. You can only control the point. As you can see, I'm controlling the point of it there, moving it backward and forward, and then sweeping it through. But I have no control over where the legs go. And that in itself gives the, the sprite a certain amount of behavior over which I have no control. And that, for me, is very interesting. But we've tried these sprites out with numerous different operators, I think probably about 80 operators over the last two, three years. And often people who don't have um, a lot of confidence in their movement skills or uh, who perhaps are, are just a little bit more wishing to be in control don't tend to go as much for the star sprite because it has so much innate behavior. I'll just I'll, I'll say something about my experience of, of operating um, the sprites. Uh, and again, this goes back to my, my background is in lighting design and operating a lighting console in performance. Um, and the experience of, of operating something like the Star Sprite in, in a workshop environment was um, really quite a profound one for me because I'm, I'm not a trained dancer and I felt by a, being able to operate these light forms in the stage space there was a dialogue between myself and the on-stage dancer and I felt like I was in a duet, I was performing with the dancer on stage and that was really quite, um, uh, quite profound experience for me as an operator which we've attempted to kind of explain this, uh, this experience. Operators have developed preferences very early on for sprites, particular sprites, and that's often partly due to their own personal movement preferences. Do they like uh, long fluid sweeping motions? Do they prefer uh, um, small movements or jerky movements? Or you know, what, what kinds of movements do they personally like? And what kind of movements do they personally produce as well when they're working? Uh, it's a very intuitive input device using the graphics tablet because we all draw, we all write, so we're all familiar with the pen on the surface. Also, we're projecting onto a two-dimensional surface, and that in itself has a whole load of, of complications uh, uh, surrounding that, but we are projecting a 2D inscription to a 2D screen, so there is uh, a, a logic in the way in which uh, the work is, is produced on the screen. We found that operators um, become very, very engaged in what they're doing. We've also found that dancers don't think about the operator, they think about the sprite, even though they know the operator is out there. So there is a meeting of the dancer and the operator in the engagement through the sprite. And what we're just very briefly going to do is talk you through actually what is a, a, a fairly long article, so you really are only going to get a fairly brief uh, uh, run through this, but just to give you a flavour of what we're talking about. Now, in relation to the dancers, we, were, we had always tried to make sure that the operator was in the view of the dancer on the other side of the gauze, because we felt that that would enhance the sense of the dialogue between the two. But our dancers consistently talked about the sprite as being their partner and didn't talk about the operator and when questioned would um, say that actually they really weren't aware of the operator, they were aware of working with the sprite. And we, we looked at the work of uh, Castronova in modelling digital game avatars and Castronova talks about people working in uh, virtual environments, in game environments. And he talks about the fact that there's a, th a three-way equation going on, if you like. There is the, the choice of what the character looks like in that game. And he says some people are happier inhabiting a world as uh, a tall elf rather than a small, short ogre. Um, and you make the choice about what you want to look like in that world. And that's the physical attributes of the character. But behind that are the, uh, the non-physical attributes of the person who is operating that character. Um, their personal preferences, their ways of communicating, their behaviour. Do they run around a lot? Do they stand very still? Do they move quickly? How do they talk to people? All of these things. And these kinds of behaviours are non-physical behaviours. And when another person meets that character in the game, they get the sum of those two. They get the physical attributes and they get the non-physical attributes and they see something that is created from the combination of those. And we linked that with um, Ziff's uh, analysis of the stage figure, which you can find in Game Macaulay's book, um, in which uh, there is the stage figure, there is the actor, uh, there is the, um, the physical uh, manifestation on the stage, which is the stage figure, which is the, some of them, the look of the act, the makeup, the costume, all of these things. 
And, but the character that is produced in the minds of the audience is the sum of these two things together. And we found that Castronova's digital game avatar and the way it is perceived, and Zich's um, stage figure character and the way that is perceived, actually helped us to think about how the dancer perceives the sprite, because what they perceive is the operator's movement preferences, movement habits, movement choices, combined with the sprite's inherent physical behaviour, inherent behaviours of itself. And those two things come together and make that entity that the dancer dances with on stage. We tried con concealing from the dancers when we were swapping operators over, handing over pens whilst on the table so that the, the sprite remained there and, and not letting the dancer see what we were doing. Every time the dancers know when the operator has changed, even if the sprite is the same, because that facet of the operator's movement preferences and choices has changed, even though the sprite looks the same. So that, that is, is kind of thinking about what the sprite is on the stage. It's that sum. Then thinking about the operator's experience. We've had, as I say, about 80 operators working with the sprites over the last two or three years. They've come from a whole range of disciplines, including dance, sonography, theatre, fine art, um, live art, a whole uh, lot of, of different uh, discipline backgrounds. So we've tried to get some breadth there. Two words that have kept coming up again and again are the sense that, it is th that the medium is transparent, and we've, we've had discussions with Steve Dixon about this word before, so which is why it really interested us, and also that the experience is magical. So we tried to think about, and we, oh, we asked the operators where they remember being during the period of uh, operating. Um, I think all but one of the operators reported either that they were on stage or that they didn't know where they were. Only one person uh, reported remembering that they were sat behind the table using the graphics tablet. So there's a sense of dislocation or translocation that's inherent in, in the way in which this works. Now, I'm going to whisk through this fairly quickly, yeah, because we're running out of time. But the, what we did was we, we looked at um, some ideas about um, viewing the artwork, because, of course, the operator is sat outside the space and looking into it. So they're viewing the stage picture. And we looked at Bolter and Gromola's transparency and reflectivity, but actually that binary was too great for us, and we were more interested in the sense of becoming and the ephemerality and the creation of the sprite over time. Uh, so we went uh, to Crowther and we, we were engaged by the idea of body hold and the rapt attention, the rapt contemplation and the, the, the folding of sensory, motor and uh, effective capacities so that they become a unified field. But that's still thinking about it from an external perspective. So then, this is a mighty quick run through, um, we, uh, we also looked at Frawley who takes... Um, uh, 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 Merleau-Ponty and is problematic in, in many ways but, but we were interested in her talking about the lived body as being um, uh, existing in, in that state of rapt contemplation but being the, the composite of the body and mind functioning in a, in a fold that in, in some ways similar to the sensuous manifold that Crowther talks about and the embodiment of the act of operating is a physical and a kinesthetic experience that we felt enfolded the body-mind, but also the, the, uh, the interface and the graphical representation, so that the whole unit becomes the operator's experience as they are in that, in that place. They are operating both visually, in terms of what they see, but also kinesthetically, that, that unit is functioning. Uh, simultaneously and that embodiment of the interface is something that really interests us and is, is, uh, is fundamental to the role of the performer operator. If you'd like to know more about that uh, and go through it at a slightly slower pace then there's an article in Digital Creativity. And all of that work is kind of central to the um, AHRC funded projecting performance project so this, this was the work workshops that came out of that very particular project uh, working alongside KMA. We're, we're and, and here are some of the um, images from the latter part of that project where um, we've moved away from using Director uh, as, a, as the um, key software to using Max MSP and there's a slightly different quality to um, the sprites themselves and the way in which they are behaving on stage. And here you see in this next picture the, uh, the drawing that was also part of what we were doing. So this is, this is me having um, drawn around two dancers on stage who have traversed from stage right to stage left and 
at, they've created uh, images with their bodies which I've then sketched with a line with an infinite delay so it's it stays it stayed there and you can see there that's the that's the result of their movement across the stage so almost like camera images uh, s frozen and the, the stage picture um, develops across as they move across the stage interesting for, for me who's a sonographer the Greek origin of sonography skenographia is actually literally writing in the stage space and this idea is very important in terms terms of work uh, that we've done later on with um, DV8 uh, Theatre Company. We're going on to talk now about another project that happened alongside um, projecting performance and this was the Dancing in the Streets project which was in 2005. Uh, where KMA came to us having had a commission uh, from York City Council as part of their Renaissance project. We used the same um, techniques uh, of uh, uh, iterative play within a, um, a theatre environment. This particular work was a piece of consultancy, so we've, we've talked to you about the research work and in this one KMA employed us as consultants on the project. Uh, and this piece was uh, an, an outdoor installation of um, kinetic light projection uh, in a, a very strange little square without a name interestingly, a very old uh, square uh, in the old Roman uh, garrison actually in York off of a, a, a main shopping street called Davy Gate um, and this is a picture of the space in, in the daytime up a couple of steps uh, and it's rather like a, a raised stage space bounded on three sides by buildings and walls with the uh, streets uh, downstage if you like. The technologies that we were using for this particular project were um, using the sprites but this time projected from above downwards but what was critical about them was that we were using a heat sensing camera of the type that's usually on the nose of NATO jets to sort of seek out bombing targets and we were misappropriating that for artistic purposes and we suspended that above the, uh, the square so that it sensed the heat of bodies moving in the space when people moved into it. The data from that was then fed through to the computer and the, uh, the sprite images were projected back down, mapping the sprites to the heat sources. So when you came into the space, you were followed by lights. And from a distance, at night time, you would see um, light moving in the space or maybe po possibly bodies engaging with the light forms in the space. And the, the brief was that we had to get people dancing in the streets. So the process that we went through to get there was we invited Kit and Tom into the theatre that we were using and uh, we, uh, we, we worked in the theatre space. We had some problems in that we discovered with the heat sensing camera above the people moving underneath that we had underfloor heating. So uh, we ended up wandering around the place with hot cups of water in our hands to get hot spots, but that was just one of those what, things. What you see here, though, is um, a really important part of our devising process, because, again, we're using our, our student body and other members of staff, inviting them in to come and explore the potential of these um, projections. And just in, in the similar way we worked with the sprites in that very first uh, laboratory uh, workshop, we are also saying, actually, this is, the, this is the football game here, you can see, where um, originally KMA turned up with... Um, a, a sprite or a series of sprites that gave a open circle to re represent people's bodies uh, well in fact three points of heat the body uh, the, the, the two hands and the head actually creating three open circles of light and through exploring this idea we suggest actually Tom could you make could you make some other um, light objects that were solid because we could actually use them as almost footballs and we could we can move them around kick them around the space and this gener this turned into a football game and, and we'll, sh we'll show you that in a second we have now a little bit of footage from uh, the uh, the square. This was the opening night, and some uh, some some dancers, some some street dancers, found the space. We didn't know they were coming, and you can see them exploring and finding that the uh, that the the lights follow them, follow their body heat through the space. And what we found was that the nature of the space, as it was, set back a little bit, up some steps, um, and in a in a very small area, a very dark area encouraged people into that space and helped them to behave in very playful ways. Because they're looking down at the floor where the light projections are falling around them, people became, seemed to become quite unaware that other people were standing around them and watching them. 
And because a lot of the, uh, the techniques that we were using were based on playground games, things like football here, as you can see in action. This is a Pierre Chassereau map from uh, the mid 18th century of York. This is, this is there for the city council's benefit. But actually, it was worked very well as, in terms of just exploring the old um, roads of the city through trails of light. So people, people came into that space and they were playful, they skipped, they, they moved. In this one you can see butterflies chasing people, but if you run away from your butterflies too fast, they lose you and they fly off by themselves. Um, so there's a certain amount of unpredictable behaviour that makes them quite engaging. And here you can see a lady who uh, is demonstrating the playfulness of what, what people were doing. She's not aware that it's her body heat, she thinks it's her clothing that's causing the, uh, the lighting. Um, but you get a sense of that playful interaction that was absolutely central to this and we believe that it came out of the playful processes that were involved in the creative process and this is the, uh, the work that we're, we're hoping to take forward in uh, another project very soon. The football game is really in, important to the success of this installation. Um, we, we, the installation was supposed to be a three week uh, um, period in, in York. In fact it was, uh, it was extended for about five months in the end because of its success. People would, who realised that this opportunity was there in a, in a forgotten space, a liminal space within the city, began to um, adjust their evening behaviour. So they'd, they'd turn out to the clubs and the pubs and actually do a detour into this space to play football. A lot of them actually wait for the football game to come round and um, then engage in competitive team play. And, and the development of that uh, idea was that we had to extend that um, period of, of, the, of dancing in the streets to a kind of five minute section. All the others were on a football. kind of two minute um, rotation. So. Um, and th there were two goals either end, so there kind of th was kind of competitive play developed. And then that moved forward into five courts, which you can just see up there. I put up a little bit early. Uh, five courts was a football game that was designed for light night, and uh, it was simultaneously projected in Leeds, Hull, Sheffield, Bradford, and York. And this is the one in Leeds that you can see here. There are four goals in each of these football areas. The Representing the other four cities uh, that are at, uh, at remote locations and this, the courts, the various projected courts, are linked via the web. So if you hit the ball through the hole goal in Leeds it will appear in Hull. Um, and we had situations where a group of, this is actually on the university campus, a group of students who, who were from Hull, that was their hometown, were stood in the Hull goal blocking the balls and saying, no, kick them into Bradford and, and so forth. So we had, we had battles going on uh, within, uh, w within the courts. And at the end of the sequence, it would be announced and projected onto the floor which city had actually won that particular game. And these are just a few other examples. You may have come across Flock, which was a uh, uh, collaboration with KMA, ICA, and uh, the Royal Opera House, and, uh, and Tom Sapsford, a choreographer. And it, it used uh, the, uh, Swan Lake as the basis of uh, projection in Trafalgar Square. And then the Hive, which uh, was done in Dublin, I think, last year, if I remember yep. correctly. So that's an example of the public installation work, which is using the sprites, but in a different way. Uh, now, so we've just identified sort of an uh, uh, enterprise knowledge transfer outcome of our work, uh, our research outcome, and this is using the research in a teaching and learning environment. So um, our undergraduate program uh, has a, a public performance module for our third years, uh, and I was, um, I, I was tasked with leading one of these companies back in 2007, and I thought about how might I um, uh, assimilate research and use this as a vehicle not just for teaching and learning but also to help us think about uh, our, uh, our ongoing research in projecting performance. So uh, I thought well why not take the idea of a Midsummer Night's Dream and using the sprites as the um, a virtual fairy world because the fairy world in Shakespeare's play is always um, somewhat problematic I think um, and it, it, it it offered potentially a vehicle for which we could develop uh, our thinking about the sprites. And it, it worked very well because Tom Wexler at the time had a Nesta uh, uh, grant, a regional Nesta grant, which meant he had some time and resources which he could develop his own practice. So it was, and they were, I think KMA were really happy to have a very um, focused brief uh, to help develop their own practice. And it also gave our students access to working with industry professionals and the experience of what that kind of collaboration might mean. So it was a very important learning experience for them. 
So there's a few images here from that particular production. So here you've got um, Bottom and Titania. I should explain that it was, uh, well, it was a, a production normally set in the 1990s with the, the wood, as you know, the lovers escape from the, the Athenian court. They escape from the kind of parental authority into, um, into the wood. Uh, we had... Um, uh, we had this idea of the wood as a rave, as a kind of secret meeting place. Uh, and the mechanicals, obviously Bottom's one of those, they were all members of the Territorial Army. So they've, they're on night manoeuvres. So that explains why Bottom's here in camouflage and his, um, his transformation of donkey is the kind of camouflage on his helmet. Um, and behind them, you can see projected onto strips of gauze, two fairies. So this is... Um, here, these are actually voice reactive sprites. So the the the, the students playing the fairies are, are on microphones off stage. So they're doing that over hill, over dale, thorough bush, thorough briar, and the 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 sprites actually pulsing with their voices. At the same time, one is being operated by Sita and one by Tom and they are being able to move them across the whole stage space on the bodies of Titania on her face, and also they could fly around the space. This section is from Titania's Bower, where the environment of the Bower is actually drawn alive within the, within the stage space. And you don't really get a sense from this uh, picture particularly, but the kind of a 3D effect of almost like a kind of the old time tunnel effect of the... Of the um, again, this is being drawn live in the space and the colours being shifted as it's being drawn. So this is actually our star on infinite delay. So the whole... Uh, the whole world in which um, Bottom and Titania, this is the, this is the kind of the lovemaking scene, uh, that lovely speech about the Woodbine and Eglantine, uh, actually, and the actual the mimicking of the, the movement is uh, replicate, is, uh, is um, uh, echoing the, uh, Shakespeare's words. This is the rave. You can see um, behind the different gauze strips are the, uh, the performers, uh, they're, they're dancing, but we're using the heat sensing camera from the front this time, and it's literally picking up the body heat behind the gauzes and projecting light back where it sees heat. And over the top of that is um, one of the sprites being moved rapidly uh, to create the star effect that you see. So it's a combination of the technologies we're using in the projecting performance with the operator-controlled sprite and the dancing in the streets military camera technology important in terms of the concept for the production that we set up a, a sequence of the movement from the Athenian court as it were uh, uh, which we were using more as a, um, a, a kind of um, uh, city brokers really rather than the Athenian court but into this kind of uh, world where where the chaos can happen but that was quite important we had a kind of a, a sequence uh, to entrance to set you free in fact where though where those sprites those fairies arrived uh, I'm just flipping through too quickly now Hang on. What have you done? What no, I've messed it up. <laughs> and in Act Five, um, we wanted to uh, we wanted to use the sprites in a way. Uh, there is the mechanicals come out of the woods, having rehearsed their version of Pyramus and Thisbe, and of course it's Shakespeare taking making fun of himself in terms of his Romeo and Juliet. We wanted to use this idea of the bad acting to think about how we might use a bad projection. So it kind of we consciously use a sort of a naive. Um, projections in terms of um, creating the environment for this, uh, this play to take place and taking, taking the mickey out of ourselves in a way. So here this is Sita's uh, naive drawing of the wall and um, deliberately illustrating uh, the, the aspects of the text. What we had at the dress rehearsal, we had an open dress rehearsal and we invited academics and professionals to come, uh, industry professionals to come along and see what we were doing in terms of the experiment and it was about disseminating our research. And one of the people who came along was Lloyd Newson, who had heard about our work at the TAPRA conference. And uh, Lloyd was particularly taken with the, uh, with the drawing and with some of the other aspects of, of our work and he uh, asked us if he could come and do a couple of days workshops with us in preparation for To Be Straight With You. And for anyone who's seen the production of To Be Straight With You, the, uh, the scribbling of the hands, the globe effect, the, uh, the writing both on the chalkboard and on the screen came out of uh, the workshops that, uh, that Lloyd came and did with us. So it's a very important example for us 
of the way in which our work was having a direct impact on the in industry and the, the relevance that it had to, uh, to performance. Yes, although it's worth uh, noting that our work was drawing live in the stage space, which had a kind of r a deliberately rough quality to it. Uh, DV8's work is actually pre-prepared, rather like the England uh, video we, sh we showed earlier, but nevertheless had the same quality of um, the drawing appearing as if live in the stage space. Uh, I'm not talk about this in, in detail, but the, the following year there was another uh, um, final year performance uh, for the, in the undergraduate program at Leeds, uh, and we used again some similar technology to the uh, dancing in the streets to help um, with the scenographic uh, answers to a, a deconstruction of um, the Tempest. And you're seeing here the shipwrecked uh, characters uh, being washed up on the island by a, a band of light, which is actually live video footage of waves. So they're kind of being um, sort of regurgitated onto the, onto the shoreline. And in this image, you're seeing again the, the heat sensing camera creating the illusion of water on the floor where Caliban is sitting. Another exciting thing that's happened uh, since we've been working on this project is that Lisbeth Goodman uh, heard about our work. And I don't know how many of you know Lisbeth, but she works at um, Smart Lab at the University of East London. And she does um, a lot of performance work with uh, dancers with varying disabilities. And she came to one of our workshops and brought with her uh, James, whom you can see here in the wheelchair. James has cerebral palsy. And he, but he is one of her performers and he, he has a dance that was made specially for him which is called The Seven Movements of James in which were the seven voluntary movements that James could produce although he has quite a lot of involuntary movement as well. Um, James was going to have a go with the sprite so you can see here that the graphics tablet is propped onto the table on his wheelchair and we managed, it's, it's, his arm is quite twisted but we managed to get the pen fixed uh, with between his fingers and he was able to draw onto the graphics tablet quite a small amount but with some uh, ability to control it himself and some of it was uh, sp uh, 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 spasmodic movement but he, he had a sense that he was in that contact with, with the sprite and the, uh, the, the, the tablet, tablet and controlling that and he was controlling the sprite that was on the stage and there was one of our dancers was working with him and he chased that dancer around the stage and jumped out of her reach and teased her. And at the beginning, Elizabeth has said to us, well, James normally gets tired after about 20 minutes. Well, after an hour, we had to say, James, the dancer's getting tired. Could you please let her rest? He was so engaged and excited. He was hiding from her in the rafters. And the, then Elizabeth came back to us later on with, with James and uh, with Katie, another uh, performer uh, who, again, has limited um, movement. And the two of them did a uh, duet together and with, uh, with some dancers in the spaces of performance for um, the uh, learning and teaching uh, conference with, uh, with technology. Um, but the, in terms of the enabling uh, nature of this technology, the, the performative nature for someone who normally doesn't have that much independence in terms of being able to perform on stage, to be able to have that power and to be able to interact uh, with other dancers was extremely exciting and something that we're looking at pursuing further. And this is very relevant to a quotation from Richard Schechner, which was actually originally written in 1967, but very, has proved to be very important to all of the stuff that you've been seeing, that we've been showing you, in terms of the fact that the technicians are an active part of the performance and that the technology that we're using is actually relatively unsophisticated. It's mostly off the shelf. Uh, coupled with, with Tom's very uh, uh, great programming ability, but it's not particularly sophisticated. But what we are mm. doing, we think, is making sophisticated use of our human beings and uh, enabling our offstage performers and uh, the various people that we've been working with to have that uh, presence in the stage environment that comes of the way in which we are using the technology rather than the sophistication of the technology itself. Shall I read that for our, our web viewers? Yeah. So the technicians themselves, Schechner says, must become an active part of the performance. This does not necessarily mean the use of more sophisticated equipment, but rather the more sophisticated use of the human beings who run whatever equipment is available. And that's from his six axioms for environmental theatre in 1967. So just to uh, talk briefly about the impact, we talked about the fact that the 
work that we've been doing with KMA has enabled us to engage in a range of different activities. We've been involved in research uh, funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council. We've done consultancy work with them and uh, we've also involved them in our learning and teaching activities. The uh, Wasted Grace Dance Theatre is a graduate company of ours who've worked with us uh, on this project and it's, it's enabled them to promote their own practice and their own uh, performance careers. KMA have changed their own practice and have moved much more into performance work and uh, public installation art, which is what they wanted out of this relationship. And we were very pleased with the, uh, the impact that our work had on DV8 Physical Theatres, to be straight with you. So in terms of the breadth of this single collaboration and the impact that it has, uh, we feel that it, is, uh, it, it has given us a great deal of opportunity and it's also been uh, very useful. And we've talked for quite a long time, so we'd be very happy to take any questions then. Thank you very much. Um, have me in the frame for a moment because uh, after ending the uh, presentation part, I'd like to also acknowledge um, our partnership with uh, Dance Tech TV and producer Marlon Barrio Solano, New York. We are live online right now and your lecture will also be uh, recorded for the community to review. And thank you for allowing that. And thanks to New York for giving us the opportunity to broadcast the lecture from London's uh, Center for Contemporary and Digital Performance. We are also pleased to have a uh, head of, former head of school with us who initiated, I think, some of our hopes to have uh, uh, stronger, better facilities with the new Arto Center. Thanks for some of our uh, guests who come from abroad to be with us. I've actually, one guest is uh, on camera helping us as an operator. So your remarks on operators are, are very, I think, interesting <laughs> to me. And maybe you could uh, then uh, field uh, answers to the question from the audience. What we need to do is perhaps rephrase the question on your microphone mm -hmm. for our internet audience. Okay. And I can also type it into the chat line. <laughs> but uh, I here with uh, open the floor for questions. Thank you very much. Pleasure. You sit down. Uh, I was wondering if you could give a bit um, use the, with, the, with the sprites and the thing in particular about the, the, those early experiments. Um, if you, if they all, all tended to be sort of, you know, abstracted. Whether you'd, you'd ever tried to get a uh, a moving sprite that had some some ability in the form of a human figure, so that you had another dancer, a double. So, so the question there um, is about whether or not the, the we had worked with a sprite that had kind of more human-like qualities. The way in which the sprites are programmed uh, is quite simple. They're controlled from a single point, so they can work with the pen. And so um, any extraneous limbs tend to, uh, tend to have their own behaviours around that. So actually the star sprite, if it's brought to rest, you can probably see up there, we have, we have it in a five-pointed version, which when it comes to rest does tend, if you stand it on the bottom of the screen, to look as if it has a head, two arms and two legs. And we have um, had, uh, it was briefly on, on the, uh, the footage that you saw on, on the screen, uh, one of the dancers doing a kind of samba with it. Um, which, which was, was fun, but because of the way in which the sprites work, um, to actually get anything that approximates to human movement is, is very complicated. So yeah, we have thought about it, but it's not been possible with the way in which we're working. So, yeah. uh, thank you very much for your talk, it was wonderful. Um, I have a question for you. You mentioned that with the England production and also the work that DV8 did after, after doing the workshops with you, in both instances, they didn't work in a live interactive situation with an operator performer. They worked with pre-recorded uh, graphics and, and imagery. Could you possibly say something about um, the journey that a more experienced professional company such as those might need to go through to, to get to a place of comfort working in the more experimental way that, that you are examining? So this is a question, um, which is a really interesting question, actually, about the kind of professional practice and the, the need for companies or, or the perceived need to, to revert to highly rehearsed sequences of pre-recorded projections rather than the liveness that we have inherent in our, in our particular mode of working. 
just so happens we've been talking about this today, um, so uh, so we can we can tell you a little bit about what our thinking is. Um, there's a number of reasons why they make that choice, and certainly in the case of both Phoenix and DV8, uh, the reasons that they gave were the need for um, replication, accurate replication. Now, of course, dancers accurately replicate the same piece every night. Um, and they don't seem to have a problem with that as part of their live performance. So you know, that's, that's a point of, uh, of, of some debate. Nonetheless, a lot of the stuff that they're doing is, um, is of a high quality with a lot of things going on on screen at the same time. So to be able to control that live would be uh, would be quite difficult. Um, you'd be in the situation that you're often in with a complex lighting rig where perhaps you have a lot of pre-programmed sequences but then you queue them on time, which of course uh, many companies do. The, the kind of work that we're doing uh, would require the, the operator and the designer to be present from the very beginning of the rehearsal process and to be a part of the creative process and a part of the devising of material and to be rehearsed alongside the performers. That has all sorts of implications in terms of the cost of having that person there, the need to have all the technical equipment at every single rehearsal to engage in that kind of uh, creative process. And at the moment, that isn't usually part of the way in which uh, professional companies like that work. I don't see any reason why it shouldn't be. Uh, and we were talking about this, weren't we, last week? Yes, on Friday we, we, we presented a, a seminar symposium at the Barbican Centre at Guildhall and Complicite were running. And the professional opinion seems to be that actually there's uh, um, a shortage of uh, sophisticated operators, in fact, creative operators of technology, which, which, uh, which the professionals would say prevents them from working in that, in that kind of way. There's, there's also a conflict, I think, between the need to have something that is uh, highly polished presented for a, a, a public audience and the kind of work which, which we're interested in, which actually is fairly messy and is rough around the edges. And we quite like the, uh, the fact that it can't be replicated over and over and over again. Um, and there's, there seems to be a, a conflict for me between between that idea of the high, highly polished replicatable uh, sonography and um, perhaps a more expressive and responsive form. Does that answer your question? It does. Uh, there's a company in Melbourne, a dance company called Chunky Moon, who have been, done a number of productions with Frida Weiss. Yeah. And more recently Robin Fox did mm -hmm. some, some work with lasers. Um, and, and I think the model that, that they're using is quite interesting. I mean, they work at a, you know, with very few performers and they work on a very scale in a very scaled back way in order to facilitate a, a, a real exploration but they're a professional company who are able to breach yeah. that 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 shift in practice and what it requires and and i i think it's curious to to be able to think about they can they can do it and yes on a very scale in a very scaled back way but it's not really compromising the performance mm -hmm. what can we do to get um other established companies just to feel comfortable to begin to put in place what's necessary to facilitate this kind of exploration because I think it's it's very, very interesting work and I think explorations have been being undertaken in this area for at least a decade, yeah. if not if not longer. Um, yet getting it into the mainstream contemporary performance arena is, is still really challenging. Absolutely. Are you going to try and summarise that? <laughs> Um, uh, 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 we've just had a reference to Chunky Moves and the work that they're doing and the sophistication that they're managing in quite um, a, a scaled down uh, performance uh, situation but the why, why that uh, sophistication and practice is not currently uh, being recognised and, and used in a broader uh, way throughout the, the, the industry. Does that summarise what you said more or less very briefly? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I think a lot of Chunky Moves work is uh, interactive technology um, where the performer is triggering what's going on on the stage. Not all of it by any means, but they, they have focused on working with those kinds of interactive technologies. Um, so I suppose they've, they've built up their practice in, in working in a particular way. 
uh, for someone like um, Lloyd uh, to, to change the way in which DV8 is working would require a culture change in terms of the way they think about it. But yes, absolutely, I, I take your point. It's a high risk strategy, isn't it, if you're um, handing over uh, um, such, a, a, such a, 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 an aspect of, this, of the production process to a technical operator. I, I, I actually would suggest that it, what it is is um, going from being someone who is controlling the creative process in a way to someone who is not necessarily giving away but actually engaging in a more collaborative mm. creation process that, that is perhaps differently weighted. Yes. Mm. And, and I think it's an interesting paradigm to try to get people into because I, I, I think collaboration is, is an incredibly rich place to come from and, and from your, collab your collaboration with KMA I think it's a beautiful example of what can come out of people from different backgrounds and specialities who, who share uh, goals and can influence each other. And yes, although although that, that way of working was was a very a very strange one for, for Tom and Kit when they first came to us because they didn't have that knowledge of performance processes, essentially devising processes that we, we're familiar with in, in theatre and with dance, and they, that was a revelation for their own creative practice and their and their future research and development needs, in fact, um, to be able to work in that kind of open, exploratory way without the need for, in their case, with a, working to a very specific deadline. So it's kind of that way of working sort of freed up a whole range of creative possibilities that they found very, very useful. My comment before was really what I was hearing from uh, industry professionals about saying that, um, that, that it's almost they, they, haven't, they don't feel that there is a pool of talent who they feel they can hand over that kind of creative um, control to. Um, it wasn't necessarily my own response. Do you think, but do you think that's the education system here? Do you think that's a cultural issue that people are not interested in generating those skills well, and engaging in those kind of collaborations? Where do you think that problem comes that from? Was, that was... That was central to the debates on Friday. Lloyd Newsom, for example, said he put an advert out for a catalyst operator for, for To Be Straight With You, and um, had one, they put it in an advert in The Guardian, had one respondent from the UK, and in fact he had to go to Australia to find the type of person he wanted to work with. So it, it's a, there's an element of the training, but also the, um, the training, to some extent, responds to the perceived need, I think. So there's a, a, a cycle which is, is cultural and difficult to break. Um, sorry, you, you talked about Champion Muse. The, the piece I last saw of Champion Muse, it seemed like it was strictly choreographed, even though in, in process it was they had probably worked up to a, a lot and it's strictly boring. But there's still this perceived need that it, um, a performance must be reproducible, and I, I think that's mm. a really good point. Um, I want to know, um, I, I think what you said was really good about the operator and our idea of the operator. Um, I don't know if it seems like most of your work has been sort of research based, but if you've taken it into performance, how do you cite the operator with the audience? Do you put them amongst the performers? Um, or um, amongst the audience? Or do you like them? Um, I'm just, just let me just. As a, um, a, a hidden thing. That's right. right. Let so me just repeat the question for, 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 the, for our internet audience. The question there was, um, in, in terms of the, what is the, the way in which the operator is presented to the audience? Are they hidden? Are they exposed? How, how are they uh, cited within the, performative, within the performance situation? And are they lit? And the, yeah. uh, I suppose I, I'll talk about Midsummer Night's Dream, first of all, because um, I made a bit of a mistake, really, on our dress rehearsal. Uh, in which we invited uh, academics and professionals in to see the performance. So a very small audience. Um, I didn't explain actually what it was they were seeing. Uh, and um, the operators, the sprite operators, were alongside the sound and lighting operators at the back of the auditorium. They're actually in the same space. They weren't away in a control room behind glass, but they were sighted behind the audience. Seat was one of those. Um, and for those who didn't know what we were doing, they didn't understand that it was a live, that, that the projections were operating live. So, in fact, it didn't make any, any difference for, for a large majority of the audience. But we have, um, 
that, that was quite an interesting experience for us. Uh, they, they assumed that it was pre-recorded, mm -hmm. uh, and whether that is because so much of the work they see is pre-recorded is, is questionable. Um, but uh, we've also uh, done other work where we have uh, sat the uh, performers, uh, sorry, the operators at the front of the audience and lit them in order to expose that. And one of the things we're quite interested in is what, what does that do to the, to the operator's body? Uh, in terms of, of their presence within the stage picture and how they work, and, and it, it's a question that we're, we're thinking of pursuing elsewhere. It's um, it, it's an interesting one. It doesn't seem to make that much difference to the audience because they do still tend to watch the stage picture, just as the dancers still mm -hmm. tend to ignore the operators, even if we're going. They are here. Uh, so um, so, but I, we we did even try some ostentatious gestures. Yes, in our research dissemination uh, at the end of the. Uh, AHRC project where we, we invited people to come on to, to, to share what we've been doing and we staged some performance work as part of that we we did kind of uh, signal okay it's we're now operating and we were lit like we are now with a desk in front of the audience and they could then see they could read the fact that I had the I had the control or I was actually handing over to seats to control the sprites Uh, the question was, is it, is it uh, problematic that we would need to indicate that the operator was present rather than uh, simply uh, engaging in the performance itself? Um, we, we, aren't, we haven't been particularly concerned about whether the audience knows or, or not. The reason that we particularly presented the operators and lit them for that last event was because it was the culmination of our funding our funded project, which was about the role of the operator. So we were talking about the role of the operator and then demonstrating how that worked in practice. So there was a very functional reason why we were highlighting the operators on that particular occasion. But in fact, the, the, the Midsummer Night's Dream really uh, demonstrates the fact that it doesn't really matter whether the audience knows or not, because some knew, some didn't. But we had similar reactions from people regardless of whether they knew or didn't that the operator was there. It was, it was a point of interest rather than anything else. Yes, the, the important thing for me was that the, the, the concept worked uh, cinegraphically and, and I don't think actually we would have been able to, to create that direct response uh, between the operators and the on-stage performers. Uh, we couldn't have done it through pre-recorded material. Certainly the, uh, the Act 5 drawing into the stage space um, where Sita was improvising live um, with what was happening on stage and you know giving the actors marks out of 10 for example for their soliloquies and um, where where Pyramus is doing his death speech you know, you know which goes on for quite a long time you know I die I die and she was writing uh, into the stage she die die in bigger letters die great big <laughs> great big letters die why don't you die and the audience of course reading that and seeing that were were um, responding to an additional level of, um, of material, which worked very well and, and I think was your kind of your response to the live moment, which you couldn't get from uh, pre-recorded material. I did very much enjoy that and, and of course it changed every night according to the reaction of the, uh, the, the, the way in which the performers were working, but also in, in the reaction that the audience were getting, which I was very aware of because I sat behind them and, and, and feeling their reaction. So actually there was a three-way um, process of improvisation going on between the performers on stage, the, the audience and, and myself in how, in how that particular sequence developed. Uh, and for, for me that was one of the points when I was really aware of how important the live operation was to the, to the, to the, the way in which the, the performance was taking place. I would be very curious to see what kind of um, parallel performance you would be able to highlight, which is the performance of the performer operator. Mm. Um, the experience of the performer operator, whether, but however it, you might do that to be able to highlight that, rather than trying to conjoin it with the, the dancing performers and the sprites, actually have that be a performance happening in parallel, because I, it sounds like that's what it is, and how you might highlight that, mm -hmm. how you might draw that out and bring attention and focus to that. Well, almost it is, it is, uh, yeah. I think you are referring to, uh, I think, a musical context. I would say in a musical context, the uh, um, operator would be an instrumentalist, like maybe maybe the other musicians, and would, would be visible there, yeah? mm -hmm. playing her instrument. 
uh, along with, let's say, movement and, and visualization as the other instrument of part of the system? It's, it's a really interesting one, and it's one that we've played with a lot, is, is how much of the operator do we reveal and, and where on stage uh, do we do it by filming the operator and projecting that in the corner so that we get a front-on view, because, of course, the operator has to be able to see the stage, so they have to be facing the stage in some way. Uh, in order to get that sense of, of dialogue that we're looking for. Um, and it is a very interesting one, particularly because our operators report a sort of embodied but dislocated experience. So they're not really experiencing their bodies while they are engaged in the operating process. They are experiencing the extension of their body into the digital spot and their presence on on, in the stage space. So it's, it's, um, it's a really interesting one, and it's one that we've repeatedly said we've got to explore, but it's not been, uh, we haven't highlighted it yet. So I think that's, yeah, definitely. Can, can I follow up there? <coughs> it, it, it appears that your voices actually travel uh, oh, to the camera, so they, they can actually hear the questions. And so I'll just talk a bit closer. Yeah. Uh, embodiment. Mm. And maybe it co follows along what you're saying. Uh, I have uh, three questions. One is you described your own experience when you were working with the sprites. Could you talk a little bit more about that uh, practice of learning to work with the sprites mm. also as a technique of uh, re-embodiment or a different embodiment? Mm. And the chunky move, I believe, when they traveled to Germany, they really brought only one dancer for Globe. Mm -hmm. In other words, most of the company maybe or two, did not work with Glow and Free Device. But no, 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 it was absolutely reduced. reduced. I think that was the only way they were able to facilitate And, and again, with DB8, mm -hmm. I wonder, you know, how it's great that you are doing consulting and actually working with other companies. My next question was uh, not so much about that, but about the difference between the um, learning process of being an interactive performer, dancer, musician, mm -hmm. or operator, uh, on the one hand, and I think this is something you addressed when you asked about the difference between performance presentation and interactive installation in the market square. Yeah? How, how do you think your work uh, is experienced by the uh, people in the, in the square who, who step on these things and, and uh, know there's something happening in terms of response, but uh, they, of course, are not rehearsing it. Yeah, I mean, the, the, to talk about the Dancing in the Streets installation, first of all, what we, um, we found very playful responses in the way that people were, uh, w were interacting, as, as, as we said. And again, these words about transparency and magic were coming up in relation to Dancing in the Streets. What people, a few people wanted to know how it was done, but an awful lot of people came into that space, played and left, and never knew why there were lights following them in that particular square in, in York on that night. There was nothing up to explain what it was or to say how it worked or to announce it. Well, there was, but it was actually around the corner in the dark and you couldn't see it when it was actually working. So, so there was a magic about that experience for many people that was the central thing and was the thing that engaged them most. At other conferences, people have come up to us and said, when we've talked about it, said, oh, I was there. Is that how it worked? So, um, yeah, that was, that's important. If you look very hard, you could, mm. see, um, you could see the camera, which looked just like any other security camera that there are millions of in, in the UK, uh, and, and a mirror, which was, you, which was hanging out of a window. It's quite low-tech, really, which was reflecting the projector beam down onto the floor. That's, uh, but the, the, the space uh, didn't have any ambient light in it, um, which was a, a great help. Mm. Um, so the, the technology was not foregrounded at all. Uh, and as Sita said, you, you, you saw just bodies moving in light in this, in this space. Um, and people uh, were intrigued by either the moving lights or seeing other people wandering around uh, creating uh, light patterns with their bodies. Uh, does that answer your question about Although, um, you know, the term embodiment has now been used for a few years mm. in, the, in the scientific discourse or in the theoretical discourse in, in performance technologies. And I think it has the presumption to deal with issues of affect and uh, maybe mm. the neurological, physiological uh, organisms and how they function in this performance in the virtual mm. environment. And the audience in the public square uh, is not really aware of even that 
whole discourse, right? Yeah, and absolutely. So how are they embodied and how is the dance embodied that actually explores the craft of interfacing? In terms of the, the, the public participants in the square, their embodiment is a very um, uh, intuitive uh, embodiment in terms of the fact that, as you saw, they aren't particularly thinking about how they're being seen. They're having a very subjective um, experience in terms of exploring what their body is doing in the light, with the light, in this space. How are these butterflies flying around their feet? Why are they suddenly bathed in lights that follow them? And what happens? You saw the lady spinning, holding her coat out and just exploring her own body in relation to what was happening to her. And the, the nature of the, the bathing of body in the light of the body's relation to the footsteps that are following you around the square or the butterflies that are chasing you, is a, it's, um, it's a holistic um, experience. We, we, we took this, uh, we, we presented this work at the Ducks Conference in Chicago, which is the Designing User Experience Conference, and there were about 500 um, delegates there who were mostly from computer design and those kinds of, of backgrounds. And they were very excited by this work because they saw it as being full body interaction. The whole body was involved. It wasn't mouse clicking or what have you. The whole body was engaged in the interactive process and the, 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 the entire body as one entity. So, so the embodied uh, experience is that, that sense of the whole body being involved in the experience and that, that being the, the interface. Um, for the dancer, the dancer engages with the sprite um, in some ways, depending on the sprite, much as you would engage with another dancer in the space. There is a, a sense of, particularly when the sprite is as big as the dancer, a sense of that, um, that engagement, that dancing with a partner and that sense of improvising with a partner. For when, when dancers become very familiar with working with the sprites, they will behave towards them in much the same way as they would if they were improvising with another dancer. It's different with the smaller sprites like the snake where it's, it's much more um, like working with a puppet in, in some ways in that it's, it's little and it, it, it crawls around on your body and, and you can play with it and tickle it and it'll respond if Tom's on the other end. Or, you know, so so there's, a, there's a different kind of quality to that dynamic. As the operator, the, 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 the sort of translocation is the experience of where the operator remembers being is really about the, we think it's about the way in which the, in the embodiment of the operator is channeled through the interface into the sprite, the, uh, the, the presence, the sense of being, the sense of moving is there rather than here. And it's one of the reasons why it's so empowering for, for James Brosnan, the, the, the man in, in, in the wheelchair with very limiting movement, to be able to fill a stage space uh, and move wherever he likes, is that sense of the, the translocation of self and the, ex or, or you know, it depends how you, you, you think about it, there's a sort of a sense of your presence being over there, but there's also a sense in which you're very aware your movement that you're doing here is the movement that is happening there, and your body is extended, digitally extended into that space. And this kind of creative delight of being able to see one's, one's work represented in the stage space live, which for me, from my lighting background, often you know, with computer controlled lighting boards being set perhaps away from the main space, behind glass in a control room, and being told to press a button like. LXQ5 go, you press a button, and being, and being um, removed from a kind of real, really creative uh, expression in the stage space. That was really liberating and very exciting. People describe it as dancing. They describe the mode of operating as dancing. And for me, because I, I trained as a dancer, but I have a, a back injury and I can't dance anymore, but I dance when I am working through the sprite with those dancers. And for me, the experience has all the qualities of dancing, uh, so there's a there's a, a, a very much a, a, a bodied engagement in, in that. Please, um, you mentioned in your presentation, and I think you have in your in your, your writing as well, the, the importance of play in creation. And I was really, I, I especially in dance, but in, in other professional, um, it touches on what we were talking earlier about professional companies. The, 
Well, I think I think the success of the Dancing in the Streets installation is was fundamentally down to that idea of using theatrical, playful processes in a devising situation. Because we were able, we had a couple of days. It wasn't a long long time actually, but we had a, a, a couple of days where we were actually test test things out physically. And I think that we explained how the football game came about through through people playing with the light in the space and then thinking about, oh, there's potential here, and it's that trial and error which is really, really important. The suspension of any need for a specific outcome, the uh, breadth of opportunity and possibility within play has led us to so many places that we wouldn't have gone otherwise. I mean, we didn't even mention it today, but I've done some work with robotics and dance as well, and we, um, we engaged in a, in a playful exchange between a dancer and a robot that led us to discover that the robot was embodied. Sorry, the dancer was embodying the robot, and then playing with parameters that she could change on that, and experimenting. And we, we we discovered that actually the dancer's ability to play with movement, with an understanding of what that movement by, might be, meant that the robotic scientist could watch the dancer and come up with new ideas for designing the robot because she was playing in a way they can't when they're building machines that cost a lot of money and if you take it to pieces and rebuild it you haven't got what you had before anyway so so playing as a way of generating ideas exploring sometimes within rules sometimes without rules and and the possibilities and opportunities that that throws up is central to us and also as we were explaining earlier quite unusual when you're working with uh, technology in terms of the way in which Tom is able to play with the programming as we go very very quickly so there's a, a, a sort of mutual exchange that's possible and there. the MIDI interface which we developed allowed much more flexible play I mean for example we we needed to be able to fade out sprites KMA didn't really understand why why there was a need to fade out but obviously in, in the dream we needed to say no actually the sprites need to go we we can't lose them anywhere because the projectors there across the screen they need to fade out so we needed to fade to black KMA have acknowledged that way of working as being a really quite critical to their evolution of, of process and, and they had been used to working in a studio, in their sort of a digital studio environment and then producing work for the, the music industry but to very tight deadlines and they were very frustrated by that as a creative process so I think they found coming to work with us uh, opened up a whole new array of possibilities and I think for us in higher education that's something really that, that um, fulfills a need, the fact that we have these resources, that we can open up our spaces to enable that kind of um, free play to take place. And in terms of the work in which um, Lloyd, Lloyd Newsom saw, because he came and we invited him to come do some workshops with us, uh, and we, we, sh we, did, uh, we again played with a whole array of sprites, one of which was the idea of scribbling with, the l with lines, just scribbling on bodies, or uh, we've shown you most of the stuff that's been on gauze today, but we've actually explored with other um, projects onto other materials, and we, we were just exploring drawing onto bodies, um, drawing scenes, which actually f both those ideas found their way into To Be Straight With You one of which actually a wonderful moment where where the, the opposite of, of drawing light on a body became uh, actually blacking them out and the disappearing through through literally drawing on the body now again that wasn't done live but the idea was generated through playful um, exploration in, in our workshop Yes, it's playful, but there is also a competitive aspect. And you seemed to be quite um, taken by the, the social ramifications um, that, that emerged from that situation. Can you say a little bit more about that and where you might be thinking of going with it? The, um, the Dancing in the Streets was designed to try to get people who didn't know each other to interact with each other physically. 
Um, we tried various ways of doing that. One of them was a, a cat's cradle. If somebody stepped into the space where, where other people were, then lines would shoot out. And that was the them. purple. You saw a lot of purple triangles of lights of uh, networks where, where people were linked. As soon as they stepped into the space, the lines would, would jump to them. So they were physically linked by light within the space. But of course, the football game has uh, so much potential to be able to engage people because they know the rules. Uh, they, they, they understand. Uh, the, the, the behaviour, the mode of behaviour in that particular situation. So the football game was, was very popular in a public place as a way of people being able to move into that space and make sense of their relationship to other people. We put the scores in fairly early on. Um, in, the, in the original Dancing in the Streets, some people paid attention to the scores, but quite often they were right in the far corners and, and people ignored them or didn't particularly notice them. In the light night, that was much more specifically set up. It was just a football game. There were no other uh, things there. And that was set up in order to make the connections between the five cities. And there's nothing like a competition to get five cities engaging with each other. Um, but it was on, on quite a short cycle. So the games would end quite quickly and a new game would start and they would just run end to end and people could move in and out of that quite easily but they had something to engage uh, with when they stepped into that space. The, the, the football game in Dancing in the Street started off in a very simple uh, mode and just literally two um, uh, open circles that represented each body in the space and with one solid ball of light that became the ball. Uh, and, the, and it looked like, with two open goals each side, it looked like a version of Atari 1970 Pong game. So very simple, the ball could be moved around the space, it would bounce off the walls and into the goal, and there's a, the, the score would change. Well, also, as the score went up, more balls came in, so actually it became impossible eventually, and the game ended at the point when, when everything just went, you know. Um, but uh, so, so there was... There was competition, but it was it was sort of uh, much more frenetic as set it up to, to, to become something that became unmanageable. Okay. It would be a good question for the students to ask: uh, uh, which which choreographer has dealt with games and game rules? I think Xavier Leroy did a wonderful piece where the rules were not clear. There were balls and there were jerseys and different colours, but no rules. Yeah? <laughs> yes. uh, 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 would you like? We are coming to the end, but would you like to pose a question? Yes, if I may come back a bit, so and what do you mean by mm. those people say that um, if the dancer is inside the music track, that he or she has a feeling of extending their presence. Could you maybe elaborate on how the concept of cyborg in relation to, or if that's any relevance, or, or how you uh, yeah. Uh, it's, it's some, we've, we've kind of thought about it a couple of times. It's not something that we've really explored uh, properly. Um, the, the sense of the extension of self, the operator being extended through the interface that they're using, is more about notions of, of presence than it is extension of the body, if you see what I mean. The, 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 it's, the, it's the sense of being transported rather than um, being aware of a, a technological extension. If you see what I mean, I, I, that's, that's, that's kind of perhaps making a, a subtle distinction that isn't really there. Um, it's, I don't know, is the simple answer to that, <laughs> I think, probably. Have you got an answer for that one, Scott? No, other than, <laughs> other than the, the, the translocation of mm. the movement between yourself at the, at the operating position and the uh, embodiment of that movement on stage space that has that that mm. that separation is quite is very important to us mm. so, uh, so the technology the fact in a way the fact that the sprite has its own behavior means that even though you feel that you are there in the sprite you're also aware particularly with the star of of the sprites uh, own behaviours and your interaction with that. There's sort of a, a tension in, 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 the, in the negotiation of yourself as a performer within the sprite because it sometimes doesn't quite do what you expect it to do. But that negotiation is part of, seems to be part of the, the way in which the presence, the sense of presence is, is felt uh, on, on, on the, it's, it's not, it's not alienating 
necessarily. It's it's a, a case of sort of being more in a state of sort of constant becoming, really, and, and, and in a Deleuzean fashion of of of, of being um, finding yourself in that place. And that's why, for me, it's not quite on a uh, sort of cyborgian type relationship. It's a, something slightly different from that. But I'm, I'm not quite sure what it is, which is why I can't really answer you. The, the sprites are modelled on um, Newtonian principles. So the, there is an immediate understanding of things like mass and weight and uh, the way parts of, the, parts of them are linked together through um, uh, springs of masses and so on. Uh, but there's also in the programming inherent notions of um, swarm behaviour, um, flocking, and so on, which uh, and at randomness even, which means that it, the you can most sprites you can understand how they are likely to move, but you can't ever predict exactly how they're going to be, and that that essential quality. Um, Pro provides sort of a, an aliveness, I suppose, to the event. They're they're, um, they're constantly moving. So, <coughs> sorry, I, I'm now just going to mention, it, and, it, and it, it, it occurred to me as, as you were talking about those those connections. I mean, I think it, it, um, you know, cybernet cybernetics is an interesting one. I mean, mm. the kind of cyborg is, is in some way related to it, but it's also still seen as a bit of a sci-fi. Uh, figure of you know lots of kind of uh, um, kind of hard technology uh, on, on the body, but that, that's the cybernetic par mm. paradigm that comes through that about feedback loops and, mm. uh, and connections uh, 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 and synthesized uh, syn syntheses uh, between human machine in, uh, interaction is, is, is possibly a you know an, a, an interesting uh, model, and I think that you know Robert mm. Bach yeah. and, and his work. Talked a lot, a lot in the same ways about these uh, th these connections at a distance, but also a type, you know, a type of, of creativity and a type of embodiment um, w within that. So yeah. that's, and, and I mean, I mean, the post-human discourse oh, yes. uh, uh, has also sort of been an extension of, of the cybernetic. But again, kind of post-human seems a, a scary word to so, you know, not to yeah. all, but <laughs> but to some. But uh, I think that. Mm -hmm. the cybernetic thing from the I totally agree with uh, mm -hmm. Steve Dixon and I think maybe the, the cyborg idea is sort of losing currency at the moment a little bit but on the other hand and you've worked with robotics people uh, when uh, Scott de la Junta was talking to uh, Wayne McGregor and, and his research group in London they had a speaker from evolutionary biology talking about how uh, mm -hmm. evolutionary biology is informing their designs and uh, Gabriele Brandstetter in Berlin has uh, been doing a research project in Germany on swarm behavior, studying um, yeah, a behavior of movement in, in, uh, in these kind of contexts, which I think are also taken from the study of uh, birds and insects and so on. So the fields of biology, I think, are moving forward into the cybernetic realm more and more. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is very exciting. Yeah. I think we need to stop. Uh, thank you, Dance Tech TV in New York. Thank you, <laughs> thank you. Scott. You are welcome to join us for coffee in Rococo, yeah, uh, to wrap up the evening with maybe more personal interface. Mary, thanks for coming. And thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you.